Good morning. Yes, I work for Atlassian, so thanks for the shout out there. Uh, we do collaboration software, so we're on a mission to unleash the potential of every team. Um, yes, we do some things in a variety of areas on digital marketing, and we've kind of started, a bit, started experimenting with live streaming, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. You can find me on all the social channels at Ashley Foss. If you're feeling super brave and you feel like you already know how to live stream, kindly turn your phone on, live stream the presentation. I had a guy do that one time and it was actually really cool. Um, he live streamed it to Twitter and took a bunch of pictures and so it was kind of a cool thing to be able to see you know, a live stream presentation being live streamed. So before we get too far into live stream, I wanna take you back a little bit to 2014. So this is at South by Southwest, a conference much like this. It covers all of Austin um, and businesses, filmmakers and musicians come from all over the world to participate in this conference. And so man on the street type videos are very common at these types of conferences. And so we decided we were gonna make a man on the street video. And I want you to notice a few things about this photo. First, my colleague there with this massive backpack on, he's got all of his lenses, that thing weighed 30 pounds, he's trucking it all over the city. Next, he's got this massive video camera with a mic on top of it. We've got someone mixing sound on the fly. And we've got somebody holding an off-camera mic actually doing the interviews. Now, I thought it would be kind of rude to put an actual arrow on our poor subject here, but his face is terrified. Like, can you imagine you go to this conference and someone asks you, you know, hey, do you mind doing a man on the street? Like, I'd love to hear how you're feeling about South by Southwest. Just a, just a quick video, and you agree, and all of a sudden, three people, and, and of course, I'm standing there taking the picture, so this poor guy just got mobbed by four people to make one video. So that's just to capture the footage. Then we went back to our Airbnb after a day full of sessions, an evening full of parties, and at midnight, we started downloading all of the footage off of that massive video camera. We're continuing to mix. We've got Final Cut Pro open. Then, okay, we finally, we've dug through it. Now we're gonna throw the bumpers on. Now we're gonna pay $400 for music. Now we gotta wait to upload it. By the time we give our day one recap, it's the end of day two. And I know some of you are nodding. You're like, yes, I've been there. 2 a.m., I'm still plugging away in Final Cut Pro. Your, your content's not even relevant anymore, right? It's a struggle. So why do we go through all of that? Why, why are we up at 5 a.m. at South by Southwest making these videos? Well, as marketers, we know it's because it works. So 74% of all internet traffic comes from video plays. 92% of viewers who watch a video share that video. Putting the word video in your subject line in an email is responsible for a 19% increase in open rates and a 65% increase in CTR. And if you include a video on a landing page, it improves your conversion rate by 80%. So I don't know about you, if I can post up numbers like this regularly, I get a promotion. Good for me, good for the company, right? We know video works. So why are we doing it anymore? Well, there's a lot of challenges. And obviously, those challenges are gonna get solved, in my opinion, by live video. So live video is not new. Traditional networks like ESPN and NBC have been streaming live events for years now. Businesses finally got a clue, and this platform called Livestream.com came online. And then we started transitioning to the internet. So Twitch came online. This is an eSports platform. If you're not familiar with eSports, people literally make millions of dollars streaming video games that they're playing from their mom's basement. It's crazy. It's a thing that exists. Meerkat came online and was quickly replaced. Vine, who remembers Vine, the six-second platforms? It had approximately a six-second lifespan before it got killed. Snapchat came online. Instagram, and now Instagram Stories, and now Instagram Live. YouTube finally got a clue and started allowing individuals and companies that were not traditional networks to stream on their platform. Periscope, which is now running the back end of Twitter. LinkedIn, finally, they've been announcing for two years that they're gonna come out with live stream. There's a beta program now, I've got an application in, I'm waiting with bated breath, so if any of you are from, from LinkedIn or have connections there, kindly tell them to approve the application. And of course, Facebook Live, which you're hearing about all the time. So if this slide looks a little bit chaotic, it's because the space is chaotic. So I've given this talk a number of times, and every time I go and I'm like, all right, cool, let me just click through, see what's going on in the world. This slide, I'm like, oh crap, LinkedIn finally has capabilities. Oh my gosh, okay, Instagram, like what's the latest growth on this platform? Facebook, what are you doing with your algorithm, right? So this is a very, very hectic space and a very fast-moving space. 
So today I want to focus the discussion on just these four platforms. Instagram, Facebook, Periscope slash Twitter, and YouTube. And there's a couple of reasons for that. So first, um, if you get a chance to check out the Uyalo video index, they put this out every year. Uh, so this time last year, 60% of all video plays came from mobile phones or tablets. Instagram, 80% of users on Instagram follow a business. They've got 500 million daily active users on stories. That's up from 300 million just a few months ago, so they're growing like crazy. And over 100 million users watch or share on Instagram Live every single day. Periscope, so back in 2015, the dark ages, uh, in terms of digital media, people were watching over 40 years worth of video every single day. Since it now powers the back end of Twitter, the way they've used their measurements is 28 million user-generated live streams and over 1,100 live streamed events each year. Facebook, 20% of all Facebook videos are now live. They receive three times longer views than a standard or native upload, and they get six times the engagement rate of native upload videos. Facebook is also heavily, heavily priority, prioritizing video, and within that subsection, they're heavily priority, prioritizing live video. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we know that video's growing, we know that video works, why aren't we doing more video? So how many here, it's a budget issue. It takes way too much money to create these videos. Had this challenge. Time, the scripting, the filming, and the editing takes way too long. Had that issue as well, just talked about it at South by Southwest. Talent, nobody wants to raise their hand for this, but I see one like nodding in the darkness. We don't have strong spokespeople. Who's gonna actually talk on camera? The ROI, because it takes so much time and because it takes so much budget, we don't have the viewership or engagement to support that. And finally, the resources. We don't have an in-house team. We don't have strong vendor relationships to help us with the editing, the shooting, the filming, and the scripting. So live streaming helps solve these challenges for a couple of reasons. First of all, it widens the spectrum of video. So in the past, we basically had two ends. We had free but terrible and amazing but expensive. Now as brands, we couldn't afford to create anything except amazing but expensive. This is your $50,000 video. You've got to rent a studio space. You've got to rent all of this fancy equipment. You've got to rent lights. You've got to prep everyone. You've got to have hair. You've got to have makeup. And if that thing flops, you're screwed because it costs you so much money. What live stream allows you to do is not only widen the spectrum, but it gives you a more continuous range of content that you can create on that spectrum. So now you don't, you're not restricted to just free but terrible, which is your traditional home videos that your parents shot, or amazing but expensive, which is what brands used to be able to create, and that was it. Now we have what I'm coloring moderate cost but authentic. So you can use a tripod or a steady cam. There's multiple mic options. You can do on location or studio, and the scripting is flexible. So this is where we're mostly seeing brands and individuals grow their content via live video. Some of the benefits of live video, first, it's got a low barrier to entry. So previously I mentioned, we're lugging around all of those backpacks full of lenses, you've gotta have Final Cut Pro, you have to have special software. Today, everybody's phone has a camera, a mic, and editing software right there on the device. Next, the ease of distribution. So previously you had to pull all of that content from one medium into another medium to be able to share it. Today, every phone has Wi-Fi. You can leverage your existing audience. So most businesses already have some form of presence and some form of engagement on audience on these four platforms. So again, right there on your phone, you can now capture and edit the footage, connect to Wi-Fi, share to your existing audience. And then my favorite, you get to capitalize on human behavior. So things like the scarcity principle. Periscope was originally founded on the idea that this content would only be available for 24 hours. So you could engage your audience and say, you gotta watch it now. Tune in, come back to us over and over because you don't want to miss this live content, it's gonna go away. That fear of missing out. Oh my gosh, what if I didn't see the live stream? What if I didn't see what happened at the conference? What if I didn't tune in to what this person was saying or sharing? This also works really well if you're offering discounts on products or you're doing time-based sales. Um, again, it forces your audience to keep coming back because that's gonna disappear. And then it also helps you build a sense of community. So in the past, all video was basically one way. 
I'm gonna stand up here, I'm gonna talk at you, and you just have to listen or leave. What live video allows you to do on these social platforms is take comments and interact and have a two-way conversation with your audience. So now I'm about to get real prescriptive. I'll go slow, so if you wanna take pictures, there are you know, legitimate copy snippets that you can just grab and use for a couple of different use cases and hosting styles. So first I wanna talk about the sneak peek or behind the scenes style, live Q&A, the, oh my gosh, this is happening right now. Watch a planned event. And last, a daily recap or sharing insight style. So the sneak peek and the behind the scenes is great for things like product launch prep, photo shoots or video shoots, life at the office. In this case, your description would be what it is. So you would say, potentially join me live on Facebook at 10 a.m. for a behind the scenes look at the book or product launch prep, the photo shoot, video shoot, life at the office. The title would be behind the scenes or sneak peek of whatever the event is. And then for the hosting style, in this case, you'd wanna narrate what you're doing. So this is saying who you're with, why you're there, what you're doing, how you're doing it, and you would wanna acknowledge questions from the viewers. Next is the live Q&A. So this is great for interactive keynotes, analyst calls, merger acquisition town halls, and also product demos. And in this case, your description would be tune in for a live Q&A of whatever the topic is. This is great if you know who you're gonna be speaking with and they are also an influencer. You can tag them in either the description copy of your tweet or the description section of YouTube um, or your copy on Facebook or Instagram. The, the title would be just very simply the Q&A with the person's name. And in this case, the hosting style is gonna differ depending on who you are in this video. So if you're the MC, basically the person asking or taking the questions, you wanna act as if you're the moderator. If you're answering the questions, you wanna think like a panel member, and the session should be interactive and take questions from viewers. So just similar to how at the end of this presentation we'll pass the cube around, that's a similar style to what you'll use on live video. This is one of my favorites, the oh my gosh, this is happening now. So this is great for demos on a trade show floor, huge lines in an event, random people doing something crazy. So I'm a huge musical theater nerd. That's what I do in my spare time. I sing, dance, act. Um, that's kind of my tagline on social media as well. And I got the chance to see Hamilton. So if you're not familiar with it, it is the craze that has taken over not just the, the musical theater world, but the world in general. And so when I got a chance to see Hamilton, I was like tweeting and live streaming and texting all of my friends because it was happening right now. And everyone got really excited that, oh my gosh, you're seeing Hamilton, tell me how it goes. In this case, your description is literally happening now because you don't want to miss it. The description, if you, or the title, if you have the ability to, quickly say the descriptor of the cool thing. So the power wall reveal at Tesla, Techapella, this is an event that happens in the Bay Area for charity, and it's basically all of the tech companies here that have acapella groups get together and put on a performance. So again, close to my heart in terms of tech and musical theater, it's merging two of my passions for Techapella. So that was another one where I immediately started live streaming that um, and literally just put at Techapella, and that's it. In this case, the hosting style, it'll be your choice. So whatever this thing was, was so cool or so dumb or so shocking that you just had to share it right now. So describe it, talk about it, interact with followers in the way that makes the most sense. Next is watch a planned event. So this is great for keynotes and speeches, interviews, concerts and shows, and also product reveals. So this is a picture of me and my baby sister on her wedding day. And I know it sounds funny to be like, why are you showing a picture of you and your sister on her wedding day? Um, I'm focusing most of my examples today on B2B, but actually a number of fashion brands, um, including Louis Vuitton, have done a ton of live streaming for their behind the scenes events and their spring shows or their fall collections. So having pictures of two gals in front of a mirror wearing makeup is actually a pretty appropriate thing for this. In this case, the description would be, I can't wait for whatever the event is. That could be the Dreamforce keynote, a VIP speech, grand opening of a location. The title would just be the name of the event. And in this case, the hosting style would be to say what the cool thing is and stop talking so people can watch. Here, you want people to feel like they're sitting next to you. So obviously, you're not all sitting there whispering to your colleagues every single time I say something. That would be really rude and distracting to both of you, right? So in this case, you want it to feel like the person is sitting next to you. And last, the daily recap or the sharing of insights. So this is great for insights from sessions, keynotes or demos, 
Trade shows are hosted event wrap-ups, and also interview takeaways are key themes. So one thing that's interesting, this morning at breakfast, I was chatting with someone, uh, and his comment was like, how many of these kinds of videos, of like a selfie video, and it's gonna be like, hey, I'm hanging out at Digimarcon, it's awesome, okay, bye. Nowhere in there is there an insight, or a key takeaway, or a learning, right? So the goal with this is to actually share a couple of things that you found interesting, or that you learned, or that, you know, someone else could use. So in this case, your description would be I'm sharing about day three at TED, South by, media tour, um, tune in on YouTube. Uh, the title would be recap, day three of the event. And then in this case, the hosting style is talking at the audience in first person. So you would use a lot of I statements. So I loved seeing this keynote. Um, this person just announced this thing. Um, and I also loved what this would be. Uh, you know, this was a perfect event for me. Um, and sharing what you're actually learning. In this case, it's your kind of host choice if you want to acknowledge the commenters and take questions. If people say, oh, it looks like this session was really interesting. What did you learn from this session? Or you could just do it reporter style as kind of a, a readout from the day and your learnings. So I want to show a couple of real world examples. In a lot of cases, these, um, I'd say 50% of the cases are ones that I've personally worked on and seen the results. And then in other cases, it's just showing how brands are using it. So first is an example from Atlassian. So we just had our big user summit in Las Vegas, um, about 5,000 attendees at this conference. And we did a mix of different live streaming techniques. So in this particular case, uh, this was our Jira software team and they streamed directly to their product Twitter handle. And as you can see, they're streaming directly from a phone, but they have a gimbal. So this particular gimbal is in kind of beta release with one of our partners that we work with called Shootsta. And it's got a small little mic, and then the gimbal is made for an iPhone 10. One crazy thing that happened to us, it actually shifted smack in the middle of the broadcast. It went from um, streaming in a horizontal orientation and just randomly flipped to vertical. And normally, if I was making a $50,000 video, I would freak out if suddenly the air condition clicked on, or suddenly the lights went out, or a camera fell off a tripod. In this case, literally just kind of moved over and said, okay, I'm gonna reframe the shot. And that's a totally acceptable thing to do. Obviously, it's not my favorite that that's what happened, but it worked well because of the nature of live stream video. We also combined it with a more sophisticated platform. So we were using Inexpo to stream live stream sessions to our official website. Facebook does allow you to schedule live stream events, and then you can give those URLs and those server keys to your, your platform partner, and it'll show it with multiple camera angles. As you see down here, we've got title cards, um, we had a countdown, we had bumpers. So you can do this as sophisticated as you know, framed up with lights, or something like putting a phone on a gimbal. And then we also did a mix of on-the-fly stories. So this was literally shot on a phone. This is our CMO. I had basically scheduled him to be at an activation that we were doing on the show floor, and that's it. And I showed up and we kind of figured it out, right? So in this case, you want to have a host that's skilled at on-the-fly storytelling and skilled at being able to ask questions. This is kind of the, oh my gosh, this is happening now style. And what works about this is it doesn't have to be perfectly, there's no ums, anything can happen, right? So I actually, um, there was a gal who was working the activation and explaining it to people and just kind of on the fly was like, hey, would you mind actually filming this? Because the person who was supposed to come and host the video didn't show up. So I stepped in front of the camera instead of filming. And then a few minutes later, the host showed up and she just like handed me my phone back and I kind of slid around behind the camera and passed it off to the two of them. So that authentic connection, um, as Catalin was talking about earlier, that one-to-one, -one, that human, that sense that you're actually making a one-to-one -one connection totally works on live stream video and social video so that you're not having to be so perfect all the time. So this was from um, whenever I worked at Duarte. If you're familiar with Nancy Duarte's work, she wrote Resonate, and her and our colleague Patty Sanchez released a book called Illuminate a couple of years ago. And so we actually live, did a whole live stream campaign around the building and launch of that book. And this was the moment that the galleys, which is the first hard copy of the book, arrived in our lobby. And so the receptionist texted me and said, Ashley, the books are here. So I turned on my phone, I walked to Nancy's office, and I was like, hey, come out to the lobby, grab Patty. So they both came out and this was the first time they saw their books. And we live streamed that for everyone else to see. They were like overcome and choked up and they went back in to tell the rest of the office and got a spontaneous standing ovation. 
We also live streamed all of the video um, shoots and photo prep that we were doing for things that were going in there. We did a whole tour of how we created the illustrations for the book. When we hosted the launch party, we did a live Q&A, so both people in the audience and also live streamed to Facebook. And then on the media tour, I also went with them and filmed and shared on social. So what's great about this is that you also, because it's so easy and cheap to do, you can capture all of those moments that would kind of be throwaways that aren't worth spending five, ten, twenty thousand dollars to capture, but you can spend that time and money to capture those moments into their own campaign. The other great thing about this is in a lot of cases, people only had time or space to speak to one of the authors. And so while that person was being interviewed, we were able to run our own separate interview and engage with our followers on social media. So that time was being utilized in two different ways. So IBM has also done this. If you're familiar with Watson, that is their AI incarnation, I guess is the best way to call Watson. Um, so they have a number of large conferences. They do things like concerts. Um, they've given Watson a persona. And they live stream a lot of these things on YouTube. And then they also share that on Twitter so that you can connect in, in multiple ways. This is Buffer. It's a social media platform. And they host uh, regular chats. And what I like about this example is they're showing how you can bring in two people into a chat. So you can do interviews, you can do webinars, you can do live streaming conversations through Facebook um, just by connecting people. Salesforce live streams their keynote from the road. So they obviously do this a ton on social media and on their traditional platforms. In this case, this would be similar to the Watch a Planned event. So what's great about this is now instead of having to only share a link, you're able to engage people on the platform, which again, all the platforms want you to stay on their platform. They don't want you to click off. So it keeps people in feed, it increases the engagement, and it increases the reach because the algorithms on the platforms will prioritize content that keeps people in their feed. NASDAQ hosts a regular show on Facebook Live. And again, they're using a higher level production value to stream through. So they've got things like title cards, they've got um, various multiple camera angles, and this gets huge engagement. So you can actually go to their channel and watch all of the different interviews that they've done over the last year. I want to talk a little bit about Instagram stories. So we're, we're not doing a ton with Instagram Live just because our content doesn't really lend itself to that. But stories is great for both photos and videos. And you'll know if someone has a new story by the little multicolored circle that goes around their logo. What's great about this is it's perfect for time-bound things that only a subset of your audience would care about. So in this case, Cisco was hosting the Hack IT Finals. There's a very small number of people who would care about that and a small amount of time that it's relevant for. So stories stay live and available for up to 24 hours unless you add it as a highlight to your profile. So this is perfect for all of those requests. I know I get them all the time. Hey, we're hosting this meetup tonight. Can we put it on Instagram? And I'm like, yes, send me three to five photos shot in portrait mode you know, with any hashtags and any accounts that you want me to tag, and we'll put those on stories. It's perfect for that evening because that content is not going to be used more broadly outside of that event. We do this a ton at Atlassian. So we've just started using stories probably in the last six months or so. Our recruiting team was originally using this as a channel to showcase life at the office. And if you look, um, we did a movie day. And you'll see down there, there's, I've got my Coke, I've got my popcorn. Who the heck wants to see that on an Instagram feed? Nobody. It does not need to live for all time, but it is perfect for showcasing what we're doing right now and showcasing a cultural moment that, hey, we go, we see movies, we're fun to hang out with, this is a cool culture. Um, we also do it for our um, IT and events. So we curated a story that had 65 posts in it for our Atlassian User Summit. It was a mix of videos and photos. And it was nice because um, since it doesn't live forever and the artistic value is not the goal of that post, you're not having to show, you know, okay, let me get down and let me frame it and let me do the bokeh. This is just quick and dirty, authentic, this is what's happening. The crazy thing about this is we see retention rates from 50% to 75% on these posts. If you look at the, the first people that looked at the post all the way to how many people see the last post, it's huge retention rate because you can tell these stories. 
WeWork also does a weekly wrap up on stories. It's great for employee engagement. So each week they showcase a couple of employees doing crazy things, smart things, fun things. And I love this person on the end who just finished their first week at WeWork. They're so happy, right? Like who wouldn't want to join or be featured or come work at a company with someone who's that happy? So definitely check out Instagram stories. It's a nice low stakes way to experiment because it's only live for 24 hours. So see how the engagement works. See what it takes for you to create those stories um, and make sure that you're engaging with people when you post. So we've talked about a number of different ways to host. We've talked about a couple of different brands that are doing these things. So now I wanna talk a little bit about what kind of video should I use? So I get this question all the time. A lot of people are like, yeah, I'm all in on live video all the time. As much as I love live video, it's one tool in your toolkit. It does not replace every single piece of video, audio, visual content that you could have. So our good friend, The Buyer's Journey, where are you at each stage from awareness, consideration, purchase, and retention? And then think about your goals for each of those stages, the programs that you're running, and finally, what assets you have to use. See a couple photos, I'll let y'all take those. Um, and then this chart. So this is focused specifically on video and I've broken down a couple of different options per channel. So for example, in the awareness phase, your goal is to make the prospect aware of their problem and also make them aware that your company exists. The programs that you would be using would be things like mass media, social media, thought leadership, and event sp sponsorship. So the video assets that might be relevant for that, live video is perfect in the awareness stage. You can do things like the daily recap at the events that you're doing. You can do sharing insights on social media, and you can also live stream things um, from the keynote or the show floor. If you go all the way over into the purchase decision, for example, an explainer video, a pre-recorded thing that talks about specifically the benefits or the features of your product, if you need to have a very concise, perfect, wordsmithed message, using a pre-recorded video for that is probably gonna be much better than a live video. So how do I choose a channel? So key questions, first, where are you in the buyer's journey? So again, when you're talking about awareness versus, um, or top of funnel versus bottom of funnel, that's gonna significantly impact where people are hanging out and how they're engaging with you. In the awareness phase, they're gonna probably be hanging out on social media, probably on your website. When you're down at purchase, particularly for uh, products that have a high price tag on them, they're probably gonna be engaging one-to-one, face-to-face, on a phone call, on a WebEx or a Zoom, right? Where does your audience spend time? So this is another thing that happens a lot. People come to me with assets, they're like, put it everywhere, show everyone. And I'm like, this is not gonna go well for you on Instagram. Well, but we could at least try. And I'm like, no, the last five of these that I did on Instagram tanked and it messes with your overall engagement and brand perception. So the idea that you should just shoot all of the video all the time to all the places doesn't work. It's not gonna be a good use of your time and it's gonna dilute your brand reputation. So where are people hanging out? If they're hanging out on Twitter and they like to engage with you there, hang out with them on Twitter. If they're only on Facebook, put your time and effort into Facebook. Next, what is your brand persona in each channel? So this is huge. So for example, when I was doing work with Nancy and Patty, the two of them have very different public and private personas and different thresholds. Nancy is totally an open book. She let me take behind the scenes pictures. She had a crazy brush in her hair while she was getting her hair done for a photo shoot. We took pictures of her just like the first time she went live, I had put together this whole Periscope strategy and I gave it to her and I was like, you have to read this before you do it. She picked up her phone, turned it around and goes, oh, if I hit this, what happens? Oh my gosh, am I live right now? And she turned the phone around, and so I grabbed it, and I was like, hello, 40,000 followers, we're teaching Nancy how to do Periscope today. And I was like, all right, Nancy, give them a tour of your office. And that worked for her because that was her persona and her tone. Patty, on the other hand, comes from a much more academic approach. She likes to be polished, she likes to be thoughtful, she doesn't want people to see all of the prep that has gone into the stuff that she's presenting. And so when I sat down with her to do our live interviews, most of the time, we were talking through a prepped set of questions that she felt comfortable answering, right? She would not be comfortable with, hey, yeah, just turn it on, I accidentally hit the red button, right? So think about that in each channel. And finally, how are you gonna leverage the video in the long run? 
So in our case, in a uh, we ripped a lot of these videos and put them on other channels. So we could embed them in blog posts, we could add them to our YouTube subscription channel. Um, in some cases, for example, Instagram stories, if you look at Atlassian's channel, we have few or no highlights because the whole point of curating the story was to bring people in just for that moment. So think about how you want these videos to live in the long run. Is this something where you're intentionally trying to play on that fear of missing out or that scarcity principle? Or is this part of a larger campaign that you want to live for a long time? And a few filming tips. <clears throat> Some of these are a little controversial. Like this one, horizontal versus vertical. If you want to get people riled up, ask them this question. People get so angry, They're like, you cannot film vertically. You're going to get the black bars. It means you're an amateur. It's terrible. Fun fact, there are some of uh, the features on Facebook that only allow you to film vertically. The reason that I know that is because when I first tried to film horizontally, people were commenting, rotate 90 degrees. You're, you're upside down. You're on your side. And so once again, we're like, well, we're doing this live, we're just gonna tilt the camera and then comments start floating in. Hey, thanks, now we can actually see you right side up, right? So be aware, um, Instagram stories also tend to be preferred to curate those in portrait mode. So, but if you're gonna rip that content and save it and put it up on YouTube, it's probably better to film horizontal. So again, going back to what is the point and where are you using this and for how long will influence whether you're filming horizontally or vertically. This next one is generally good life advice. Don't be a creeper. Don't be that person. So as video and particularly video on phones has become more ubiquitous, most people are a lot more aware that someone might be filming. But I don't know about you, um, the other big thing on my bio is Fitness Fiend. So there's been a few times I've been at the gym and there's this one guy who is like obnoxious about the, the phone. He's walking around, he's got his video, he's got a tripod and he's like, we're working out. And I'm just like, dude, it's 7 a.m. Nobody else here wants to be in your video or watch you try to shoot content. Like, please stop. The other big thing, if you're going to film someone, ask them. Let them know that you're doing that. Um, obviously, it's one thing if, you know, I'm kind of off in a corner doing my own thing. But I should not be coming up and shoving a phone or a camera in someone's face and being like, hey, you're on video. That's not cool. Don't be a creeper. And last, mitigate motion sickness. So how many of us almost threw up in Blair Witch Project or Tree of Life. Did y'all see that movie? Yeah. I got stuck sitting in the very front row and I legit had to leave because I was about to vomit. It was so shaky. So this is a big problem because now that casual sense and that authentic sense and human sense, like, ah, yeah, I'm filming, is acceptable. But that doesn't mean that your audience still doesn't have to deal with the physics and science of biology, which says that if you're running around shaking, they're going to puke. You don't want your audience associating puke with your brand. So there's a couple ways to do this. The first is to pick a fixed point. So for example, if I'm interviewing someone and I say, hey, let's take a walk, um, I would want to focus as much as possible just on their face while we do that, because that, in theory, should be a point that's not moving. The other thing is if you're going to pan, say that, and then pan slowly. So hey, I'm going to take a look over here. This is the audience over to stage left. Now I'm going to move over, and this is the audience kind of in the middle. And then here's the audience over on stage right. Instead of being like, yay, audience, like that's going to make everyone feel ill. And then third, if you have the opportunity to use um, a steady cam or a gimbal or a tripod, all of those kind of external things, they're super cheap to get, but they'll help you mitigate the, the motion sickness and they'll, they'll steady your hand. So literally as you're sitting here holding something, um, those things will balance out, making sure that you're not having a shaky shot. So for more resources, I've written two uh, slide shares, slide share ebooks. They do not require anything, no email address, nothing. I'm not selling you anything. Literally, I just think live video is great and it's been really helpful as a tool in my marketing kit, so I want you to have those things. Jeff Bullis has a number of guides on marketing and they're great. He talks about video of all types. He talks about a bunch of different tools, metrics, and includes more examples of different brands. Again, you don't have to pay anything or give an email address to get great content from him. And then finally, from Marketing Profs, um, the video marketing guide. So this includes a mix of live streaming, social video, and also traditional video techniques, and gives some benchmarking. And now I'll open it up for Q&A.
or give you time back if you want to go to the bathroom. That's also a good option. Yeah. Okay, one question that I have when we're talking this video content and lights and everything, where do we, would we include the blogs in, in this category? And I'm asking particularly because, oh, sorry. <laughs> so the question is about the vlogs. Yep. And where would you include the vlogs in uh, this? let's say customer journey and would you f find them relevant maybe for creating awareness or consideration which part of the funnel um, would you recommend them yeah so we've used I've used vlogs in a number of different ways um, I tend to put those in a category where it's a regular cadence and it's something that you're using all the time um, and it's also a relationship building tool so the only reason you you would tune in to hear me all the time would be because we have a relationship. Yeah. So that, from my perspective, tends to be um, moving from the top of funnel into middle of funnel. Um, most of the time, because those topics have traditionally been a one-way broadcast, there's not a lot of relationship building other than the fact that you're tuning in. But if you were to substitute those with you know, a day in life content or substitute those with some sort of campaign that you're running, I think it also depends if you're doing B2B versus B2C. And if the point is more around like recruiting, or if the point is around selling a product, or the point is around thought leadership, I think that really depends. The nice thing is that um, because blogs tend to already be in that casual style, you could just continue to use the same cadence and funnel strategy and just move them onto a platform that has wider reach and lower barrier to entry. So instead of having to have a ring light and you know your camera settings and all of that, turning on a phone, turning on a webcam, and just streaming that automatically to Facebook or Twitter, um, or if you have access to LinkedIn, is a great way to incorporate those. Yeah, thank you. And Mike, oh. uh, I have a question about creating sort of legacy value from live content, and uh, if you had any recommendations for best practice around uh, archiving content that was live, if you recommend, you know, after the fact, editing the video or just posting the the you know the live video somewhere in a complete setting, yep. and just sort of like how to get persistent evergreen value out of uh, live sessions. Sure. So what's really interesting, particularly on Facebook about live video, is that they prioritize that live video even once you finish the live stream and it's on demand. So in the past, when we've used this strategy for non-scheduled um, videos we still see a massive amount, like we may only get, you know, 10 to 100 people tuning in for the actual live stream, but then within a couple of days, people watching the on-demand, it skyrockets it to two, three, 4,000 views, right? So there's a couple of different ways. If you do pull it down to edit it and then you re-upload it, it's gonna get treated as a native video. So it's not gonna get as long-term engagement. So what I would suggest is, particularly thinking about that before you turn the camera on. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can still capture that content if you want to rip it and say embed it in a blog post or send it out in an email campaign. And that's just by going to the settings and clicking save to phone. And that way as you're live streaming, that content will also get used, um, will get saved into your phone gallery. So if you want to do that, you can then pull that content over, you can trim it, you can add bumpers, you can add title cards, you could add closed captioning. Um, so 98% of video is viewed without sound. So adding closed captioning after the fact and then having it shared as a native video is also great. Um, so I, I would just say it kind of depends. The other way to do it is if you create a regular series. So for example, NASDAQ, that's something that happens all the time. So now that whole show has the evergreen value, not just each individual episode. So it kind of depends. If you're trying to do something that's evergreen, scheduling it and sharing, hey, we're scheduling this, it's live, check out this demo all the time is really great. Mm -hmm. If you want it to live on, but it's more of a moment in time, ripping it and embedding it in a blog post is also possible. Any others? Good? Cool. Well, thank you very much. I'll be sitting right over there if you have other questions or concerns. And thank you so much. <laughs>